All right, everybody, we will uh, call this meeting to order of the Sustainability and Resiliency Committee. I'm John Strand, your chair. We might have some folks still running in, but let's just run around the table and do an introduction, and we'll start with the uh, mayor on my left. Uh, mayor Mahoney, and I noticed my parks director walks on the grass when he comes to the city hall. Is that to exercise my grass or what? I was going to look at a flower bed. <laughs> Dave Leaker, Fargo Park District. Paul Mathis, Cass County Electric Cooperative. Bruce Grubb, Fargo City Administrator, and I have to uh, uh, let you know that Brenda is at an energy summit and speaking about the Roberts Alley power line burying. She's representing the city there and will be hustling to get back here. So thank you. Greta Graming, Public Rep. Uh, ben Dow, Public Works. Brock Morrison, City of Fargo, Facilities. Bruce Tarleton, Inspections, and I'm going to start adding code enforcement <clears throat> because that has become more than half of my job. Uh, Nicole Crutchfield, Director of Planning. Jen Sweatman, Public Rep. Thank you, Jen. And over here we have Diana, if you want to introduce yourself. Diana Bauman, I work in the City Commission and Administration offices. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everybody for making uh, the effort to be here today and to, to attend. Uh, are there any changes to the agenda or any additions from anybody? If not, the agenda will just stand as it is presented. Uh, are there any corrections or additions or changes to the minutes of the last meeting? If not, uh, Let's have a, a vote just simply to approve the minutes if somebody would make a motion and second it. Bruce, motion. Second, moved, second, moved, and I'll second. seconded. Uh, Dave, all those in favor of the minutes say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay, good, we have a couple more folks joining us. When you grab a, cha a chair, we'll let you introduce yourselves, and then we'll continue on. You can go first, Casey. You turn it green. Punch. Yep. Okay. Casey Steele, public representative. Blake Mikesell, Fargo Public Schools. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, for uh, joining up. We're just getting started here at the moment, and I have uh, one more person, and we'll go on. We'll let you grab a mic, grab a chair, and introduce yourself. Uh, Sean Paschke, XL Energy. Now, we're all here. It's a much more cozy arrangement now that we're post-COVID mask-wearing era. And yet, if people are still being cautious, if you haven't been vaccinated or have been exposed, you know, we, we, we encourage you to use your masks and be cautious in that regard. And yet, uh, it's been quite a time to get through this. Bruce, why don't you introduce our topic for today? I'd be happy to do that. And where it's from, and kind of set the, the groundwork, if you would, for it, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, after 15 months, I like being close, but this does feel awkward. I, I have to admit, it just feels like something's wrong, but I'm happy to be this close to everybody. So uh, as we discussed at our meeting last month, uh, Cass County Electric Cooperative offered to give a presentation to the committee regarding their efforts in the areas of sustainability and resiliency and at the time, some questions were raised about the crisis that occurred in, in Texas that we all heard about and uh, what steps locally have or are being done to try and prevent that from happening here. So uh, I would like to call on our SRC member, Paul Matthews with Cass County Electric uh, to give his presentation. I've seen it, it includes some uh, good background on Cass County Electric. Uh, their use of both traditional and renewable forms of energy, as well as uh, talk a little bit about that event that occurred in Texas and how that relates or doesn't relate to us here. So, Paul, with that introduction, the uh, floor is yours. Where do you want me to, where do you want me? Up order. Okay. And thanks for doing this, Paul. Yes. I think a lot of us have had this percolating in our brain since Texas 
since it happened down there. It'll give us a chance to vet it locally and learn at the local level. So, great. Brenda made it just like I told you she would. And Brenda, you want to introduce yourself? I apologize for being late. Getting across town is all this road construction. <laughs> Don't you have one of these buttons that opens who, the Who can light? we talk to about that, Brenda? <laughs> I am Brenda Derrick. I am the city engineer for the city of Fargo. And it kind of goes without saying, we're really proud of some of our female leadership and department heads in the city of Fargo. Uh, it's nice to have two at the table here, and that's a, that's an, a message to the rest of the community that we, we, we that, that's just the way we operate here. We have great talent. Thank you. Uh, yes. Enough okay. editorializing. Just All right. Just click through. Click down. Yep. Paul, you okay. have the microphone. Thank you. There, there's a lot of slides here, but some of them I'll, I'll move fairly quickly through and uh, feel free to ask questions um, as, uh, as you see fit. Uh, today's objectives, we're going to learn a little bit more about Cass County Electric Cooperative, uh, learn a little bit about our, uh, I did take some of the energy management system out of there, but we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll cover that briefly. I tried to narrow it down and cover what I figured would be the most interesting and valuable information for you all. I will talk a little bit about power supply and delivery, also about MISO, the max gen of it, and what some of those acronyms mean. A little bit uh, per Bruce's request on our knowledge of the Texas event and how that took place and how that affects uh, our area. Uh, a little update on Project Tundra, which is a carbon capture and utilization project, and a little brief touch on the future energy supply. Um, this is our, our mission statements, our serve our members energy needs with affordable and reliable electricity. We are a cooperative, uh, so we don't refer to them as customers, but they are member owners of our, of our uh, cooperative. Core values are safety, accountability, integrity, commitment to community, and innovation. And our strategic plan all derives on, on basically this, this, uh, uh, these values right here. So everything that we do is, uh, has an aspect tied to this uh, small chart here. Uh, some quick facts, like I said, we're a member-owned, not-for-profit cooperative. Uh, that means uh, anything, uh, we call it margin, so anything at the end of the year that's above and beyond our operating expenses is called uh, margin, and that margin goes back to our member owners um, in a sequential order uh, in the form of a capital credit check. We roughly have about 53,400 accounts uh, in about 10 counties here, all in parts of 10 counties in Southeast North Dakota. Uh, just about 6,000 miles of line, 41 distribution substations. That's where we take, uh, that's our demarcation point, we call it. That's where we take over from our power supplier who is Minkota Power. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we have about 1.3 billion kilowatt hours sold here in 2020. Uh, just a little bit about our community focus, our com commitment to community. This is just a small part of what we do. I won't read all these off, but we're big into helping out the food banks, the food pantries, Habitat for Humanity, uh, Meals on Wheels, Farm Rescue. Uh, Operation Roundup is, is um, a foundation that's uh, of Cass County Electric. Um, 501c3s come in quarterly and present, and then we uh, that board is a separate board, awards the money uh, as they see fit to those organizations that come in. Uh, and apply for those uh, that, that funding. Uh, we've raised just about $3.25 million since 1993. And what Operation Roundup is, is on your bill, it rounds up uh, to the nearest penny, uh, you know, the whole dollar. So it, it's uh, not penny to the whole whole dollar. So you don't have a, a power bill that says $143.57. It just rounds it up to $144. That money goes into this operation found up and is donated back into the communities. A uh, little bit about some of the electric vehicles and the technology that Cass County Electric has been kind of a pioneer and a leader, I believe, in the state. Um, we have uh, uh, we have two vehicles on our fleet and looking at others. Obviously, the check technology is changing every day with some of the big manufacturers for GM um, getting into this market. Uh, we do offer our members an off-peak rate um, and a one-time rebate for uh, charging. Um, it's a $50 per KW on the charger up to a $500. So basically just about covers the cost depending on what you get for a level two charger. Obviously there's quite a variety of scale there, but this covers kind of a basic charger. Um, we were awarded some funding through the Volkswagen settlement. Uh, if you've heard of that, um, we did get uh, three applications awarded for that for level three charging. That's the fast chargers, uh, the DC fast chargers. So they're 62 and a half KW, which is a, 
that's a, that's a great load for CAS, but it's a bad load too because they're on for a short period of time uh, and, it's a, and it's high demand. Uh, those are located at the West Acre Shopping Mall, the Hornbacher's Gateway West, and then the uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau in Fargo. Cascon Electric was a big part of getting the first all-electric school bus in North Dakota. We partnered with the West Fargo Public Schools, uh, Minn Kota Power, Secure Energy Future, and the North Dakota State Energy Program uh, to make that happen. Uh, basically, through some donations and new technology uh, funding um, and the SEP grant through the state of North Dakota, uh, we were able to close that gap and help West Fargo get their first all-electric bus. Um, and, and the charge up with homegrown North Energy is kind of our, not kind of, that's our logo, that's our tagline for our electric vehicle program. Uh, school, roughly, we, we, get, we look at the operating costs for this every month, and if people are interested more in the detail of this, I didn't share a lot of this today, but I can with, with this group, and uh, the difference in operating costs on, between a diesel and a, an electric bus, it's roughly about half the cost right now to operate, a, to operate this electric bus. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a good deal for West Fargo uh, and for Cass County Electric Cooperative. We also brought the electric motorcycle. We par partnered with Fargo Parks and the Fargo PD. Uh, they originally used this, I think they still do, to patrol uh, some of the parks in Fargo. So they, um, uh, it's about a twenty-five or $26,000 uh, bike here. Cass donated 5000 and we helped secure some other funds for this. Uh, it was a great project that we worked with with the city, uh, Fargo Parks, and the Fargo PD. There's a slide missing here that kind of brings us into this, but this is our Prairie Sun Community Solar Project. Cass County Electric is the first utility in the state of North Dakota to have a, U, a community solar farm. Uh, it sits over, uh, we actually uh, use some land of the city of Fargo. We worked out a deal with the city of Fargo, a partnership, I'll call it, uh, over by the water treatment facility there on 52nd Avenue, uh, or it's 74th, right, Bruce, 76th, or I forget the exact address there, but. 63rd Street yeah. and 52nd Avenue there South. You, you can't miss it. It's a big water cooler. Yep. Yeah, really big. Yep. Six million gallons. So in exchange for the use of that property and for, we donated two of the, the outputs, two of the panels of the city of Fargo. Um, and there is 324 panels um, and there's a, we're about 75% sold out and this project started in 2016. Uh, so we promote that and have that available for members that are interested in, uh, in the community solar. A little bit about our power supplier that I mentioned, Minn Kota Power Cooperative. Um, they serve three cooperatives, distribution cooperatives, Cascon Electric being one of them, three on the North Dakota side and eight on the Minnesota side. Uh, so there's 11 uh, member owner cooperatives that own the GNT, which is Generation Transmission of Minn Kota Power. Roughly they serve about 35,000 square miles, about 152,000 total accounts, including Cascon Electric. Uh, they are headquartered in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And I'll go over a little bit about our power supply resources, but the Milton R. Young Station, our coal fire plants are out in center North Dakota. Our power mix, 55% uh, coal, 34% wind, 8% hydro, and 3% other. What the other is is basically um, market purchases in the wholesale market. And I'll explain that here in a, in a shortly. Uh, this is just a breakdown of those resources. Uh, young, Milton R. Young is the Young 1 and Young 2 are our, our base load dispatchable coal-fired plants. Uh, we do have a WAPA allocation, that's Western Area Power Administration, of 109 megawatts, and the 34% wind is our nameplate of 459 megawatts of wind and about 34 megawatts of, the, of uh, wholesale purchases. This is just a geographic map of the location of those resources. We have one wind farm that Minn Kota does not own that, but they're contracted to buy all the energy off of the, our wind farms, uh, actually owned by Next Era. One of those farms is up at Langdon, one is by Valley City, and the newest one, Oliver 3, is located out by the Milton R. Young Station uh, just west of Center, North Dakota. Uh, joint system, this is, this is an interesting slide. Um, the capacity, that's name plate capacity. So that 459 megawatts of wind, that's 34% of the name plate. Uh, because of the diversity, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. Uh, it delivers about 19% of our energy needs. Uh, so there's the, the mix of, 
uh, between capacity and energy. And I think that's an important one for people to understand uh, the difference between the two. In North Dakota, the wind has a capacity factor uh, roughly about 42%. So, it, you know, about 42% of the time we're, we're getting energy off of our, our wind resources. Our solar farm has a capacity factor of about 14%. Um, some challenges that we face there is, is what we call load following or the, the lack of. Um, so it, the wind and solar is a must take. We have a must take contract on the wind when it's producing energy. Um, Minn Kota takes it and if we're not using it, we don't have load to sell that. It gets sold at spot market pricing into the market. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit. I apologize. There's a lot of information here. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, the max gen event and what that is is uh, MISO who is you can see that I'll have a little better map but that map that colored map there on the right uh, that's an, they're the RTO or the regional transmission operator that we are a participant in uh, that runs from basically the Hudson Bay to the Gulf of Mexico and um, from Montana to Michigan basically at the east-west boundaries um, and this was an event uh, basically what a MISO max gen event is when the load uh, is looking like it's going to or it does exceed the resources in the market um, and we had one on February 16th and we've had several over the past uh, summers and winters and you don't hear a lot about this uh, a lot of this work goes on behind the scenes um, basically uh, due to uh, some frozen plants some natural gas pipeline constraints um, low production from wind and I'll show you some slides here coming up on uh, and basically what this does is is drive up the price in the market for wholesale energy just because of the, the lack of uh, generation resources that are available that show up. Uh, so what Minn Kota saw on that day was prices over $100 a megawatt hour, sometimes up to $900 a megawatt hour. To put that in perspective, our average wholesale rate is about seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour, and our average retail rate is about 10.6 cents a kilowatt hour. That's above, that's throughout all customer member base. Um, so we were seeing prices up $900 and some more, um, you know, so that's 90 cents a kilowatt hour. So we can't buy it at 90 cents and sell it at 10 cents very long. And this is, it was even more extreme uh, in Texas and has been more extreme in the MISO market. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, on what took place in some of the utilities there that drove them into bankruptcy very quickly. Um, and I talked a little bit what is a max gen event. This is basically the, the uh, load is exceeding generation capacity. So they do day ahead forecasting into that market and all the, uh, um, all the people that participate in the market, some are members, do day ahead forecast. So they submit on how many megawatts of wind do you think you'll have, how many megawatts of coal, how many nuclear, what do you expect to end of the market and what do you expect to show up as a capacity in energy market. Um, that's a big difference between the Texas ERCOT market, which I'll talk about here shortly. Um, but when things are uh, expected to show up and they don't, uh, the load does and the generation uh, does not show up, it, it causes a lot of trouble. That day, MISO was facing obviously coal nuclear uh, and natural gas plants with some issues due to the coal, but mostly delivered. In that MISO footprint, there is currently about 22,000 megawatts of wind nameplate. Uh, on that February 15th and 16th, we had about three to four megawatts that showed up. Uh, the day ahead forecast was about 14 to 15,000 megawatts. So that's what was submitted into the to MISO from the uh, generation suppliers. Um, so that's what that was part of the huge problem. Uh, the wind turbines usually stop turning between 20 and 25, typically minus 22 degrees. Uh, so we had some icing issues, wind lack of wind issues and extreme cold, uh, which really dries up the load or the demand for electricity. This is a snapshot of the MISO market, I believe on the 15th or 16th, this was the 15th. Um, you can see the resources over there. This, this is a graph of basically what I just told you, uh, 22,000 megawatts in that box on the left showing that, that line graph there. That is between the 13th and 19th on, on uh, that top mark is kind of the, is the nameplate wind and that's what really showed up in the wind. You can see the variability and, and how MISO has to deal with that uh, intermittent sources is, is a challenge to deal with. 
This is a lot going on in this slide, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But basically, this is Minn Kota's resources. Uh, HE stands for hour ending. So the red line is uh, is our load, is meant the entire load of Minn Kota. Um, the blue line is our allocation from WAPA, which was there. The Coyote Young 1 and Young 2 is our coal resources, which were online and keeping the heat and lights on. The green is is our is Minn Kota's wind, that 459 megawatts. Um, so you can see that we did some load management there where you see that dotted line going over the top. That is where our load would have been, and we'd have been out in the market buying market price maybe at 90 cents a kilowatt hour, but we utilized our load management system to curtail load to bring our load below our uh, resources. So it, in return, you know, we give a break to our, our members that are participating in that, which is uh, we have diesel generators for uh, facilities like Stanford Hospital, Essentia Hospital, um, electric heat gets turned off, brings on the propane or natural gas, uh, shop heat, water heater, stuff like that, all gets turned off with the flip of a switch. We can shed about half of our system load in the winter, which is about 75 to 100 megawatts that we can turn off with our load management system to help out in situations just like this. This next slide, it just shows a little better view of our wind uh, resources. That dotted, that black solid dotted line is the nameplate, 459 megawatts. This is the wind actual that uh, that took place on between February 13th and 14th. So just some of the challenges that we face when it's 25 below. Ultimately, for Cass County Electric and for for everybody else, all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, um, and Sean can attest to this. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. We try and make it so that everyone just is their heat's on, the lights on, their beer is cold, coffee's hot and everybody's just happy. And we're behind the scenes making sure that uh, that is happening. And in today's world, it is, it is a challenge. So basically, we were unscathed. Um, we come out of the uh, deal without any blackouts. We did have one of our rural substations um, that, uh, this, it gets a lot of detail here, Western Area Power, we actually wheel some power of theirs through our substation. Um, and they are in part of the SPP with the problems they had there. Uh, we did have a short outage on that substation the same time that I believe uh, Moorhead Public Service had their outage, their rolling blackouts here in Moorhead. So basically we, we got lucky there. Uh, switch gears, I look, um, uh, I look at Texas and I had one slide in here, I took it out, but it, you know, is it just, you bring a little humor to it. It's, the slide was everything is bigger in Texas, even the power outages, but Got to bring a little humor once in a while. We can laugh about it now. They're probably not laughing. So ERCOT is the Energy Reliability Council of Texas. And uh, they talked, there was an energy summit this morning that the chamber had put on, and I know Sean was there. Um, Texas is basically an island. They are completely a different animal from the rest of the, uh, the nation. And you can see up in the colored marks there that tan is really, hasn't is, isn't a developed interconnect, but they're working on that. So we're... The more connected you are when it comes to power supply, the better off we are. Um, Texas is an island, so they're they're not connected per se to the rest of the grid. They can import two to four hundred megawatts from the south, and they can port about the same from the east side. Um, you know, and they they made this decision um, a while back to to get out of any, and they just do an energy only market and deregulate. Um, what that did for them in short term is they did have cheaper energy. Um, so for a lot of years, they were high-fiving and, and uh, celebrating and they had cheap energy. Um, the high fives came to a really abrupt halt here this winter uh, when they had uh, some cold weather that took place down there seasonally, cold weather, abnormal cold weather anomaly, basically that caused about 75% of the 600 operating units within ERCOT to shut down. Um, so we don't even understand how close Texas was to a, a blackout and not just rolling blackouts, but a complete black on that entire grid, uh, which is very dangerous uh, and very, it's very serious. Um, and when a grid goes black, you don't, it's not just like a light switch. You just go flip it on, it comes back on. Uh, there's black start. Uh, they have to bring up uh, certain resources at certain times, everything has to sync and it can, it can take weeks to bring that grid back up and get online. And that's after dealing with all the issues they had with freezing 
uh, wind plants and no wind and freezing up coal plants and natural gas wellheads uh, and stuff like that. So there is going to be some change in the ERCOT market um, if uh, FERC has anything to say about it, which is the Federal Energy Reliability Council. So like I mentioned here, I, I kind of got ahead of myself. This is basically what had happened. Uh, frozen natural gas wellheads, some of the natural geese, gas peaking plants were not winterized. Uh, some of the coal plants were not winterized like, like we do up here. Uh, they have electric water heaters, gas water heaters that sit outside in Texas. Uh, we do not. Uh, so basically 28,000 megawatts of thermal plants were offline. Uh, over 5,000 megawatts of wind was iced up or just not operating because of lack of wind. The demand that we talked about, which is people turning the need for electricity with heat, lights, um, and critical loads was about 70,000 megawatts. Uh, so the peak load was just about 12,000 megawatts higher than the anticipation. Uh, rolling blackouts were needed. We talked about that. And the reason they do rolling blackouts uh, is to balance that grid, sort of, so to speak, and to maintain frequency of close to 60 hertz so that does not go black. So the reason they do this rolling blackouts and SPP got involved, WAPA got involved, is to shut down certain areas to try and balance that. So your, your sacrifice to the sacrificial lambs, you're turning off little areas instead of everything going black. And they were razor, razor close to that happening. This chart here, um, unless you're an electrical engineer, is hard to understand, but I don't completely, I'm not gonna claim to fame on this either, but I understand it enough to explain it. Basically, it's a 60 hertz frequency cycle. There are 60 cycles, uh, or 60 hertz in the system and the system had dropped down for a brief second to about 59.3 hertz, which sounds like, well, that's not a big deal. That's 0.7. That is a huge deal. And the electrical engineer in the room right now would be just shaking their head like, wow, they kept everything operating and maintaining to, to a point. They did have some rolling blackouts, but this was, a, this was a big deal, and this just shows what had happened in that ERCOT market and how close those folks were to uh, uh, catastrophe worse than it happened. This is just a graph that shows uh, some daily market prices that I had already explained. Uh, we just took the MISO LMP local, or LMP local marginal pricing and just graphed it. So this just shows it coming along little spikes and then come the 13th and 14th during those max gen events. So if you were to buy electricity, this is what the spot market pricing was doing. Super inflated. This, uh, you know, on the news and everything else where we get all our uh, accurate information, you hear that every resource was failed and it wasn't just one source that caused it. That, that's somewhat true, but for the most part, you know, natural gas is the biggest power supplier in Texas. It did have some issues, but this graph shows for the most part, it was there, it was holding the line and keeping everything on. Very similar with the coal, which is a black line. There was a blip there. You can see right on the 15th that some tripped off. Um, you can see the wind and solar um, basically did not show up. Nuclear also had some issues, uh, but for the most part, you know, did perform um, and help keep everything on. So this is was an interesting slide that we uh, we got with permission stole from SPP, which is the south uh, southeast power pool. It's another RTO that just operates to the west of MISO. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. This is this is in the in the MISO market. What I talked about just to the west, MISO and SPP. So basically, on February seventeenth, eighty percent of the power supply in the U.S. and in the MISO and SPP area were coming from coal and natural gas. Eight percent from nuclear, six percent from hydro, four percent from wind, and 00 percent from solar. Future power supply. So it's a hot topic. Um, Everybody kind of has an opinion on it. Everybody, it, it's, it's just a really hot topic item and there's challenges with every source. So where do we go from here? Um, we now, I think, are getting the message out the under, and people understand the importance of baseload dispatchable power supply. Um, carbon technology exists and we need to embrace it. Uh, resiliency, reliability, responsibility, and affordability, affordability are the key. Uh, the Minn Kota system, does and will continue to support the all above energy strategy. At the end of the day, it's our responsibility to make sure the lights and heat are on. And uh, so we're doing everything we can and following regulation and, 
and looking for direction and, and going forward, um, there, there's most likely going to be a carbon tax. There's more, you know, if carbon is an issue, whether you believe that or not, that's a whole nother topic, but it, it's here. It's a, it's a thing. And, and we have technology that can deal with that. Um, we can talk a little bit about that uh, the methods to decarbonize the future or, you know, are being pursued, pursued. And on one option that Minnesota is looking at is, is project Tundra. That's a carbon capture and utilization project. Basically that captures about 90% of the CO2 on the plant and basically drives it into the ground about a mile. There's other things that can be done with it. Um, it can be utilized in other areas. It can be utilized for enhanced oil recovery. There's a lot of different options that are being looked at and explored. Um, it, and it just takes time and resources to make something happen. And I think that is the key, in my opinion, going forward on, on future power supply is we have a lot of ambitious goals by the current administration uh, to be carbon free by 2030. Um, you know, that, that's, um, that's very ambitious. I'll give you that. Uh, just for an example, and, and keep in mind, natural gas is also uh, emits carbon dioxide. If we were to shut the coal plant down today and have all the permits in place, which we know how fun permits are to get for anything, if, if that decision was made today and we'd have to get a pipeline from Western North Dakota to the center of North Dakota, which pipelines are super easy to get permitted, you'd spend about $50 million to get a pipeline there. We have $200 million of strand investment in, in, in the coal plants. We'd spend another $300 million in a combined cycle natural gas plant. And it would take about to be conservative, maybe 13 to 14 years for all that to happen. If we had all the papers and permits today signed on, on your desk. So you're, you're, when I say that we need time and resources, that's why, that's what I mean about that. And, and everybody to be on the same page. So some people are push you, you should be all natural gas. There's groups saying you should be all wind. There's groups that are saying you should be all coal. Uh, there's there's pretty much a group in every corner uh, yelling one thing or another. So we're trying to manage and juggle all that. Uh, this is basically just a graph. There's a videos out there and stuff that Minkota has that will explain Project Tundra a little more in depth. I didn't want to get too too in depth with time and, and being uh, respectful to your time. But there's there's resources out there if you're interested that you can learn a little more about Project Tundra. Basically, for this to happen. It, it it's needs an investor that has an uh, appetite for a tax credit, basically taking advantage of that 45Q. Um, we cannot do this. Our members cannot support this or pay for this, nor would we expect them to. Um, so it, that's another challenge uh, for this to come to fruition. And there's some there are some companies that are interested in looking at it. it it's just really a matter of what's going to happen with carbon. It, is the current administration going to put a tax on it? Are they just going to tell you you can't use coal? Um, so it's, you can't make a decision until you have some direction. And once you have some direction, then we need the time and resources to make that happen. So I'm starting to repeat myself. So I'm going to say thank you and ask for any questions. And I promise Bruce, I wouldn't ramble on because he knows I can. So I'll just be quiet and, and leave it open for questions. Go ahead, Mayor. And, and everybody just be casual. We don't need to get my attention to ask or speak. Today we're talking about hydrogen, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, different things. Mm -hmm. The commission recently approved a TIF for a company that's doing battery storage. It appeared to me that technology theoretically is what may be useful on our generation of energy hanging on to it for a while and increasing the capacity to hang on to that air, uh, wind energy or solar energy so it's not wasted. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. What Mayor Mahoney is talking about is, that, you know, one thing in North Dakota is the DGC, the Dakota Gasification Plant, has been bought uh, by Rainbow Energy and one other company, and they're looking at going to make hydrogen. Basically, they're going to turn, they're going to make hydrogen with natural gas there. Uh, and apparently, you know, hydrogen isn't new. This is, uh, this was looked at 20, 25 years ago. You know, that kind of hydrogen was a big thing. And they looked at the the lack of efficiency that are making it and the the the, the um, just the efficiency of 
turning natural gas or another fossil fuel into hydrogen just wasn't there. So it wasn't cost effective. Technology today is making that look a little better uh, to have hydrogen as a future power supply. Um, I'm not an expert on hydrogen and I won't claim to be. Another thing that Minn Kota is, so Minn Kota is looking at that as a possibility. They're looking at everything as a possibility. Um, another one is, uh, you know, new technology, nuclear, and not large scale nuclear, but they're looking at these pods basically that you would set at different locations like a substation or, you know, different areas geographically where it's not just one uh, big plant. And apparently that technology is, you know, has advanced and come a long way and a lot safer and engineered properly. And, and sometimes when you say nuclear, people think back to Chernobyl instantly and they think, oh my gosh, you know, but we need to get over that and understand that the engineering today and the technology today would be a lot different and safer. So hopefully that answers your questions, uh, Mayor Mahoney. But yeah, I mean, Coda is looking at every possible aspect in future power supply, shutting down the plant, turning it back to greenfield, combined cycle natural gas, uh, simple cycle natural gas, peakers, um, hydrogen, nuclear, buying from the market, adding more wind, you know, and, and when you, and a real problem, and I, I'm going to go off again shortly, I'll, I'll stop, but it's not so much generation, it's, it's, it's the infrastructure to get it where we need it to be. There's so much constraints on transmission bottlenecks to get energy from one area of the country to the other. And to go carbon neutral by 2030, just what would be, have to be added for wind and infrastructure in the MISO market, there would be, have to be $500 billion spent just in the micro, MISO market to make that happen, just in that little area. So it, it, there's going to be a price tag to all of this. And the other question was on the uh, wind energy. We always get this thing about birds, migratory birds. Mm -hmm. My brother lived in center North Dakota. I was just curious, is, is that really an issue of the birds or not? It is. So there, um, a lot of the DNR, uh, you know, U.S. US Fish and Wildlife Service are somewhat anti-wind towers because of that. Um, there again, the media drives a lot of what everybody hears and learns or doesn't learn. So when there's bald eagles and stuff killed by these wind towers, it's usually not reported on, but it happens. We see it, we have pictures. Uh, it kills a lot of migratory birds. It kills, uh, like I said, eagles. It kills a lot of bats. Um, so there's groups that are very anti-wind towers because of that. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is one of those groups. So challenges with every power supply source there is out there. There's, not, there's no silver bullet. I have no silver bullet in my pocket. I wish I did, but I don't. Uh, because every source that you bring up, there's a group that hates it, or there's an issue, a real issue with it. So it's going to be challenging going forward. So just for the committee, we had an energy conference this morning in town, and Congressman uh, Armstrong talked about look at the youth and see what's going on. And his contention of why everything is changing is they do believe in climate change and they do believe you have to attack the carbon issue. And the difficulty the energy groups are having is the speed at which they want to do that yes. and the cost of which that will take. But the same things were reiterated by Texas was an island. They didn't share. They got into trouble. We have to share. And then we were also complimented at North Dakota because we think about blizzards and we think about natural issues that we have to have resiliency and ability to get people power back 40 below over three days. You can't tolerate that amount of time for people not getting it fixed back together. And I thought of Ben sometimes when we have the winter issues, we you just have to get things. And people can't get a grocery store in 24 hours and we got criticized because, oh, you got to get the snow out of here right away. But right. I just thought about that probably because of the extremes of the weather. We're more uh, think about resiliency and ability to take care of things more. So so we are complimented, John, as having one of the better states that actually thinks about this. Oh, that makes me wonder how our preparedness for cold temperatures might help our preparedness for these heat events. Was there any stress on the system from the recent 100 degree days? Yes. So there, um, that also can be an issue. The Minn Kota system is still a winter peaking utility, but we're, that gap is closing as we add more commercial load. Typically, most utilities excel as one of them are summer peaking. 
Uh, so actually summer events uh, can be worse the, than winter events are for us. Yeah, so it's definitely, it's, it's, an, it's an issue both hot and cold for utilities. Did that answer your question, Greta? Hopefully you're... Yeah, I guess I'm just sort of wondering how well positioned we are to get through more of these sorts of events. I feel I can speak on behalf of Minn Kota. The Minn Kota system, uh, our plant uh, is very well maintained and is uh, weatherized for both hot and cold. What we can't prepare for is on today or yesterday in the MISO market, there's 22,000 megawatts of nameplate wind. Today, there, there was, this morning we looked as one and a half megawatts there, and it's going to be 95 degrees. So as we start shuttering baseload supply, whether it's natural gas, coal, or nuclear, because of one thing or another, and we start relying on intermittent sources, and I'm gonna sound like I'm anti-wind and solar, I'm not, I'm just telling you all the facts. And that's what I'm gonna to try to do, that's what I'm going to do. That's the challenge we face. So we get some utilities that are, uh, they're, they're gonna add wind, they're gonna shutter their plants, and they're gonna play, they're gonna buy it, People say, why don't you just buy in the market? There's always excess energy in the market, which is true most of the time. And a lot of times it's affordable. Uh, the average market price in the MISO market in 2020 was 1.9 cents a kilowatt hour. You know, that sounds like a fantastic deal. And you can rely on that. So if you shut, if Minn Kota would shut their coal down, add more wind, and just play in the market, that might work. That might not. And if everybody does that, what's supplying energy to the market? If everyone shuts down their base load, where does all this magic energy come from the market when the wind isn't blowing or it's froze up? It's not going to be there. So we can't all play that game of shutting down base load, adding wind towers, and buying in the market. It, it'll be a catastrophe. And this isn't a political thing. This isn't how, how you feel. This, is a, this isn't, I don't care if you're red, blue, or yellow. This is a physics and an economics thing. The other question that goes along with that, that electricity probably is the main source for air conditioners with heat. Correct. To uh, Greta's question, probably in the winter time we use more natural gas to heat. Is that typically? Would you, would you yep. see that flip? That less you electricity, do. more gas. That's true. Yes, and you know, seventy percent of Cass County Electric's load. We serve ten counties in East North Dakota. Seventy percent of it loads in Fargo, and out of that seventy percent of that load, ninety some percent have access to XL Energy's natural gas, and they utilize it. So that's true. Mr. Chair, uh, I think we talked about this at one point in time, the uh, peak shaving agreements. We have uh, electrical as well as natural gas. And so uh, most of our major facilities in the city of Fargo, major lift stations, major buildings, treatment plants, we do have standalone generators and so when hot events like this occur we get the notification that we're gonna you're gonna be off peaked and we start the generator run that to reduce that base load to try help out we do that in the winter time as well with natural gas we have fuel oil heating back up and so we and many others try to remove themselves from that base load to try um, avoid those those peak situations so that we run into trouble. So um, I think that's a positive thing we've done over the years. Paul, I had a question. I, I thought I heard you say with this project, Tundra, uh, the uh, CO2 capture about 90% and then you uh, send it a mile underground. Did I hear you right? Correct. And they, when it when it gets down there a mile, then what happens? I well, just have to ask it, these kind of questions. It, it's sealed into the bedrock. Um, you know, the EERC in Grand Forks is is the primary company that's helping Minkota with this project and the science behind it. Um, so it, it's injected back into the ground and sealed below the bedrock. And keep in mind, you're pulling carbon dioxide out of the ground in the coal and we're putting it back in the ground. So we get some uh, pushback on that, saying, oh, you're putting CO2 into the ground. Well, that's where it came from. 
putting it back into the ground. That's how we should word that. Um, and Chairman Strand, if I may add one more thing that I had forgot to mention. In one of the challenges that we face, even with natural gas, um, is, is the on-site fuel storage and, and the volatility of a commodity like natural gas. Coal is also a commodity, but it's a fixed price over a contract that's on site. So if a tornado would burn through the plant out in center, they have on site fuel storage, unless it just flattened everything, but say it just shut down the plant, or say a boiler blew up, or the trucks blew up, and they couldn't get coal to the to the mine to feed it. They have about a week's worth of storage just sitting there ready to shove into the turbines. Natural gas is not that way. So what happened in Texas is right or wrong when the when the it's supply and demand. Super easy, right? When the demand was up, the supply was down, the price skyrockets. So they were seeing nine thousand dollars a million BTU gas. I'm gonna make this real simple. That's about ninety dollars a therm. Excel sells it to their customers for what? Average sixty cents a therm? Seventy cents? Say a dollar. Say it's a dollar. Well, they can't buy it, and they pay all you pay is a transportation cost. You can't buy it for a dollar a therm and sell it for ninety. So it bankrupted five or six utilities down there, as people were getting twelve and fifteen thousand dollar bills to heat their homes. Well, no one's going to pay that, so the utilities got stuck with it, and they went bankrupt. So you you deal at some point if you get pushed to natural gas, which also emits carbon dioxide. I keep saying that, but. I need to, you, you don't have on-site storage. And someday you could, you have liquid natural gas to prevent that or help that, you know, hedge against that high market price when there's demand and low supply, maybe. But you have to, as a utility, they have to protect themselves against that. So there's, it's a, it's a complex deal. Paul, when you're looking down uh, the pipe here to see the future, I'm hearing all kinds of changes in wind energy and power heads. So hearing that, uh, you know, 150 power heads of the past can now produce the same energy as 45 or 50. Do you see that continuing to grow? And as that grows, do we, are we going to see more reliance on wind energy? Well, I, I don't know if we're going to see more reliance on wind energy. Um, you know, there's there's starting to, and this isn't me, this isn't Cass County Electric, there's starting to be some pushback in some states and counties that are putting moratoriums on wind. Stanley is one of them. Um, you know, there's some people that are that don't want it. They don't want to see the wind towers. And I'm speaking third person, and what we hear, you know, um, for some of the landowners, it's a good deal, but others, you know, they don't like it, and they're putting moratoriums on it, so they won't see any more wind. You know, I. That's out of my wheelhouse a little bit, but that's what's happening. So I don't know if I answered your question. I don't know if we'll no, be re more reliant on wind. It depends on regulation. If you get pushed into, if they just say you can't burn coal anymore, and if that's a carbon deal, you can't burn natural gas, well, then you're going to lean on hydrogen. You know, and, that, and, and we're talking on the back end. So wind and solar are carbon-free as a fuel source, but the construction of a wind tower and the industrial process it takes to build one is not carbon free. There's roughly 800 metric tons of cement in each tower. And there's 60,000 towers in the US, give or take. The production of concrete is the number three carbon producer of all manufacturing processes. Sure. I'm I, digressing I what, off your question. Yeah, I guess what I was focused on is, is some of that moratorium stuff that you're, you're, you're seeing is that what once took 150 towers, they can do f with 45. Oh, so, so the efficiency. The, yeah, 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 okay, I, mis I misread your question. So our, um, our less yeah, there, I mean, that's technology, you know, and GE and, and uh, I forget some of these other brands. But yeah, they're, you know, they're becoming more efficient and they're getting, uh, and you can only get so efficient, right? It's, a, it's the Shockley factor. Um, so they're, they're going to run into a wall there where they're just, they can't beat physics again. And I believe that's about 60%, you know, so they're going to get as efficiency as, as efficient as they can. So you're getting more KWHs out of less towers, but that's not infinity. There's a wall there. So they'll get there and then 
That's for you. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Again, anybody just chime on in. You don't need permission to ask your questions. Go ahead. Yes, I'm also wondering, Paul, on some of your EV charging stations that you guys yeah. installed, are you guys what kind of use are you guys seeing out of them? Or maybe you, know, you don't know that. It's actually more than than we had anticipated. Um, I don't have the stats with me. I can send that to the group too, but uh, we keep track of that. Uh, we have one guy that kind of uh, just keeps track of all that, and we have level two chargers out there, and we have the three level three chargers, and. Um, they get they get used quite a bit. I mean, they're a lot more than we thought they would. You know, there's that's a pretty uh, and people tra uh, traveling through, you know, that are that are looking for these. We have them on plug share. Uh, the sites are online, so when people are coming through, they can go on those websites and find out where they can they can quick charge. And um, yeah, I, I'm pretty impressed with how much they're getting where they're getting used. I I apologize, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I can get that data. That's just a question off the cuff because with our yeah. recent install taking place and we worked with Cass County to try and match what uh, they were installing so we'd be on the same system and stuff like that. Yeah. So I know Brock has been trying to finalize that project. I kind of took the lead to the beginning and Brock's been working to finalize it. So it'll be exciting to see what kind of user we have out here at, at City Hall as well. Yeah, I think it's going to be, I don't know what you anticipate, but it, like I said, it's more than we anticipated. Let's, let's continue on that path for a moment. That's new technology, new offerings. I, I know somebody who claims that they just don't, and there's Tesla charging stations, and then there's apparently the other charging stations, yeah. I understand. So Tesla's yeah. proprietary. So if you own a Tesla, you can get an adapter and plug into any charger. If you own a Chevy Bolt, you are, it's physically impossible for you to charge on a Tesla charger. That's one issue. And, and then they tell me you go online and there's no charging stations in North Dakota or Fargo. They can't find them. They don't know they exist. And I'm going, well, there are some. There's one right out here coming. But somehow the people aren't getting this knowledge that they really can charge their cars here and can justify going and buying one now. Because yeah. before you couldn't charge them. But I'm hearing this that, yeah. you know, I have a sister who wants to buy an electric car. She says, well, I can't yet because I can't charge it. So somehow there's a breakdown in this access to information to so people can go on that path. Yeah. Well, I will say that I think we're just really starting to crawl. We're not to the running yes. stage yet, and there wasn't chargers available. Between here and in the Montana border, you didn't see them out there. And so this VW grant helped us with that opportunity to get the ball rolling. I think uh, the other thing is, I'm, I'm not sure, I haven't really talked a lot, but I, I don't think there's a lot of the EV charges or electric vehicles being used when it's 20 below. Mm -hmm. And so that might be something that's slow to slow in our process and 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 it'll it'll get tackled at some point it will but, but, but that's some of the stuff that like the electric buses have challenges when in duluth duluth did a large purchase on a few electric buses and because of the amount of heat required to keep the batteries warm they could run for about 45 minutes and then they were done and so that's some of the challenges that are faced with the battery technology mm -hmm. cold climates and so and, until that really gets taken care of and addressed we'll probably still be slow because of just our climate coming it's like cds when people change from cassette tapes yeah um <coughs> paul i if i i'm a i'm a real layman here in the world you're an expert at and most of you are real experts at this more than i am for sure as i hear the bigger picture we have a a, 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 a an issue with transmission and storage we're in a part of the world where there's energy everywhere you look like mm -hmm. food but how do you trans? How do you store it? Get it, store it, and keep yeah. it and transmit it. Is is that? Does it boil down to that? That that's a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, storage is the key to a lot of it. And you know, there again, you're you're up against physics. And in today's technology, the lithium ion battery, I don't think that's the battery of the future. You, you look at the precious metals and elements where they come from. Uh, you know, lithium, cobalt, manganese, uh, nickel. Uh, you know, China owns a lot of that assets and where those are mined and some of the strip mining that takes place um, we turn a blind eye to some of that so i i personally don't think that lithium ion is the battery of the future but if you can come up with a battery uh, that is very green and renewable and abundant boy you call me and then we'll talk we'll start a business so here's my question for you uh, here in fargo yes in our region 
and, and you, Sean, also are in that field. Are there things we could do that someday people will look back and go, look what Fargo did? You know, are, uh, on your list of bucket list of things that like a community could do to get us further ahead on this path? Are there, do people have ideas of what, and maybe, we're, maybe we're already doing and talking, but I'm curious what we should and could do that legacy down the road, people will look back and go, they were really foresightful. Personal opinion? Mm -hmm. I don't care. I, I honestly think, <clears throat> I think that, um, so we have a about 800 years supply of lignite coal, which is a swear word to a lot of people. I get that. Minn Kota has spent about $425 million already in 2011 on the back end of the plants to deal with nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, and mercury and hazard, um, or um, uh, air po or, uh, particulate matter. If we can embrace carbon capture and that technology, and we can burn that resource as clean as we possibly can, and set that standard for India and China where they're building coal plants as we speak. If we can, we're, we're just a small, the atmosphere is above us all, right? If, if just the US cleans up our act, it's really not gonna do any good, right? If everyone else does, just burns coal without any kind of emission controls on it. So why not take the resources we have and engineer the technology to burn it cleanly and safely and, and so we have affordability, resiliency, and reliability. And why don't we take all the money that we're putting in all this stuff that is rainbows and unicorns and put into something that is viable. Put the money and the dollars and the technology and the engineering into something that we know will work. That's my two cents. Paul at the Park District, we're uh, looking at building about a 300,000 square foot indoor sports complex. Yes. And I know when the school district was building a lot of their uh, facilities, they were looking at geothermal. Is that still worth anything now or is it with natural gas prices? It's, it's, it's less not... competitive at, with natural gas and that is actually going to be on our system and we can do what we call heat loss calculation based on the heating load of that and the heat loss of that building and, and gets you pretty close on operating cost. Uh, natural gas is really competitive with geothermal. The larger footprint that you have, the quicker that geothermal pays off typically. You know, so a lot of, you know, all the Fargo schools have it. Um, you know, we keep, we benchmark that energy on, on, or benchmark their consumption and demand. So we look at their cost per, K, or per square foot and KW per square foot and all that stuff. So it, it's something we have to look at with where natural gas is at and, and your specific facility. So a short answer is it very well could be competitive, but we just got to look at it when the time comes. That's 2024. Is that project or 23? Yeah, uh, March 24. Yeah, I mean, just get a hold of us, you know, when, in the planning stages and we can help out with some of that on annual estimated cost. How about is there, with all that roof space, is there any value for solar or is that not? I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> well, Pe so, yes. People have asked. You, you are going to have room for rooftop solar. Um, the challenge with solar, I think what's, I think there's a lot of things that have been overlooked with solar. One's passive solar. You don't ever hear anything about it. It's all photovoltaic. So there again, you're dealing with a lot of components that come from China a lot of precious metals and silicon and all this stuff. And then we run into a problem with the, the intermittency of it. We have, our, we have a solar farm, we have the empirical data, and that is produces energy about 14% of the time out of 8,760 hours in a year. And the huge challenge that we face with solar is it does not load follow. <clears throat> Excuse me, so what we did is we took the output from our solar array and we plotted it with the load on our substations. And as soon as our load on the substation starts to drop off, the solar is ramping up. So then we have this production of energy that we're not using, and that's gonna go on to the grid. So there again, storage, with the right type of storage would help you bring a capacity value to that array and not just an energy value. And that's exactly what Texas is going through is an energy only market. This is just a lot smaller scale. 
you know, and you're going to run into, um, you know, the cost. I mean, there's the investment tax credit that maybe you could take advantage of. I don't know, as a Fargo Parks, you, maybe you do can take advantage of that. I think it's 26% or it keeps waning off 24%. But what are you going to offset and what's your payback? What's your ROI? What's your goal? You know, to me, solar does this make any sense up here. People don't like to hear that, but it just, we have the empirical data. It doesn't work. It's not what you care about or what you believe in. It's the physics thing again. No, that was good. I mean, that, that, Sorry, I get that's, that. some of the, that's some of the information I've had, too. And I know yeah. on Bismarck, they had a biomass uh, plant as part of their aquatic center out there. And that's when, you know, before the oil boom, the gas. And mm -hmm. they basically, the company that sold the units out of business now just because of the price of natural gas and everything. So, you know, people are always asking, what are you going to do to try to help, you know, conserve energy or, or be um, more resourceful? So it, it's kind of a couple of those things. Yeah. I mean, with the price of gas, as you said, and just the maintenance of whether it's wind and the mechanical and solar, it's just not efficient and biomass, you know, <clears throat> I mean, the city's grinding a lot of wood chips right now, but the labor it takes to feed that thing. Yeah. And there's maintenance, you know, there's maintenance on every source. So you got to be fair. It's on coal, nuclear, natural gas, you know, and on our, on our solar, we, we've had two inverters. So it, it's a DC power supply that converts to AC and there's an inverter there. We've had two of those go bad. They weren't even one of them, but they're about seven grand a piece. And when it snows, we have to have someone go out there and move the snow off them. You know, and, and I'm, you can't just say, well, there's so much maintenance on wind and solar. There's maintenance on everything. There's maintenance on every power supply source there is. But just so you're aware of that, you're not just gonna put a solar array up there and a lot of them now are, you know, oscillating and they'll turn so you get a little better capacity factor. And But uh, if it's if it's made by humans, it's got moving parts, it's going to fail. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, I'm curious about, you know, I, I asked about things we should do, mm -hmm. could do in the future. And, and one of the exciting things here is we have the parks. We have the schools, we have the city, we have everybody here that most everybody that could influence anything we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Are the things we shouldn't be doing? I mean, you know, we all say, hey, what do you, what's the magic wand for the future? But are, do you have cautions for us about just be careful going down this path? Yeah. Or, you know, cautions as well as ad advisories for. I, th I think it's educating, you know, from our, our aspect, it's, it's educating and where you get your information from and, and really. People want to reduce our carbon footprint and we want to be environmental stewards and so do I. But sometimes we have to put that back on an individual, you know, and not, okay, do we need to live in this many square feet? Do we need to have eight vehicles? And so we teach conservation, we teach energy efficiency. We teach our members how to use less of our own product. I think Marble is the only other company that does that. But we teach them how to through all different kinds of programs. And so we put that back a little bit on the member. It's like, well, here's what you can do to use less energy. Here's what you can do to lower your bill. You know, everyone's always looking at someone else and how can this people, how can you save our planet? How can you do it? Well, you can, you can each and everybody can do that individually. And I think that comes through education. And I just encourage people to reach out to the Excel Energies, your Otter Tail or your co-op and get your information there. You know, and do and find out instead of listening to the media or social media, there's too much agenda there. So let's educate our members on how to use less energy and lower their footprint in each individual person, because that might end up that it might add up to be a lot bigger deal and less expensive and easier. If that was that an answer to your question? I know I digress really bad. I think you bring up some good points, John, with the cooperation that goes along with these groups at this table. I mean, for example, the EV charging station, we didn't quite have enough funds to do the infrastructure. We contacted Excel, talked to Sean himself, and they came through and they paid for the infrastructure. So some of these projects, one group can't do it alone, but then you bring this cooperation of these table, this table together and we can get things done. And so that's, that's what I see different about Fargo, Moorhead, you know, even West Fargo area than you see in a lot of other parts of the country as we sit at the table together and figure these things out together. One thing about a small community, we can take quick corners. 
if we need to, we can decide something and act. We're not like the biggest behemoth government in the world, so we can if we choose to, but it's, again, what do we choose to do? Anybody else? Feedback? This is a really great presentation, by the way. My wheels are spinning. Thank you. So Thank you for the going. opportunity. I guess, yeah, just piggyback, you know what you said, it's all about you, us, each other. Um, you know, before I started the utility, I was, I mean, I was like everybody else, right? You walk into a house, you flip the light on, you don't think twice about it. Cold in the house, it's minus 30 outside, you turn up your thermostat and away you go, right? Um, you know, and then working at the utility and learning more and more and I mean, I've got a five and a seven year old right now and I follow them around the house and I flip lights on and I'm off and I'm like, you know, I should put in automatic light switches in my house. So, you know, obviously looking through that, my wife is mm -hmm. kind of looking at me a little crazy right now, but oh. now she understands it because she sees the utility bill and she sees how, you know, saving that energy. And it's like just something that I do from what I've learned. And, you know, in the, in the winter time, I mean, we keep our house. I mean, I think my wife and I are built a little bit different. We keep our house 63 degrees in the winter and it's, I mean, you throw on a sweatshirt and it's actually not too bad. I mean, you sleep really good. Um, you know, in the summer we keep it obviously like the seventies, but you think about it. I mean, when our, when our residential loads the highest, like the seven to nine in the morning, people are getting up, they're showering, they're brushing their teeth, they're getting ready for work. Then they leave the house is dormant. And then, you know, they come back at the 4 to 6 p.m. range. They're cooking supper. They're, you know, doing laundry. They're doing all this stuff, right? So there's your, there's your peak times. Well, if a few people would push off their laundry till 9, 10 o'clock at night, or, you know, you'd not use so much water in the morning or, or something like that. I mean, it's all the little things that we could do to conserve that water or conserve that electricity or, or just little things like that that, you know, they add up. So just being aware, the awareness, yeah. I guess you can say. Yeah. So uh, there's a big thing in fitness. I'm sure everyone's heard of it, these fitness trackers, and it's part of psychology that when you see a metric yes. and it's sort of a competition, yeah. you're more apt to follow through. And I wonder if we as a community could do something like that with these conservation efforts because i don't know how many people in the city of fargo have taken the initiative to change their light bulbs so that's a great point Greg. i'll expand on that if i may um so if people can see what they're doing on a daily basis it, it kind of it's top of mind right so we have the app the cast County electric app where you can sign up for the app it's free you can see your daily consumption you can see your weekly consumption you can see down to an hour um, and we push that a lot. We're probably about 50% roughly of participation and we push it every way we can because pe people that are on the app are looking at their daily consumption and over time we're seeing a trend of their consumption going down. There's some weather anomalies in, in there, but we can weather normalize that and it's a proven fact that if you have a dashboard, so to speak, and you're watching what you're doing, you're going to be more cognizant and you're going to use less. So that's a great point. And one reason why we push that app. Great point. Drop by drop makes the inundation. It all it, it really does add up. Wouldn't that be something for Fargo for us to all create and somehow foster that culture in our community where that's a priority in all of our governments and entities, you know, where we just really so maybe that's something we can aim at is that simple messaging and culture cultivation uh, uh, in our broader community because it really would and then every little like you say every little every person can have a, a an important role in that I like sometimes it isn't the biggest thing in the world to do it's doing the little things but doing them a lot in the in a city can push your residents to the utilities for education and how they can do that the training is free we provide we provide that service you know so the cities mm -hmm. can push their residents to say, hey, reach out to your utility and find out how you can lower your bill. I think what this is doing is helping us aim for what's our purpose here sitting around the table. We're all trying to sort that out through time, but it'll, it'll surface that we'll get things to get traction on. And Greta, I like how your brain's always doing that. 
Uh, go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, kind of building off Greta's question, how many people when you're driving down the street and there's that speed limit sign that flashes at you, <laughs> doesn't hit the brakes every time they pass? Well, I do. Mm -hmm. It works. Yep. So create a dashboard. Anybody else have anything for Paul? I, so, go ahead. Yeah, I, so I just wanted to kind of follow up on Greta's and maybe expand on it a little bit. Is there any discussion with either about um, like adjusting the fee per kilowatt hour if you use so many? Because those of us around the table and others, you know, may be conscious about these things. Those that use the app are paying attention to the numbers, but not everyone is. So if you've got someone that uses a lot more but is paying the same amount as you are, then it seems like there's no real kind of reward to it. And maybe that could be kind of a built-in incentive and could reduce, increase the numbers that, of people that are paying attention to the numbers and reduce the amount of kilowatt hours that are being kind of used so overall. You want me to go first, Sean? I think what you're referring to is like a time of day rate or a time of use rate. And we do offer some of that with our, I mean, we do have a program for that in our off-peak program. So we incentivize people to, um, like for example, on floor heat, uh, we put that on what we call a daily cycle code with a ripple. So from 6 to 11 a.m. and 5 to 10 p.m., it's turned off. Because that's, like Sean said, that's a peak times during the day. So if they go on that program with us, they're going to get a reduced rate, but then that heat source is not going to be available during those times. We also offer that with air conditioning cycling. Uh, so during peak times in the summer when when load is coming above or matching resources, we send out a signal. Uh, it'll cycle that air conditioner. So if you're willing to sacrifice the load or you don't, you know, it works for you, um, you know, we incentivize that through a rate. Um, we're also looking at an actual um, time of use rate for EVs and for just residential uh, just a residential meter period where just during certain times of the day and night um, It's going to be cheaper at night or cheaper during the middle of the day and you can decide if you can shift your laundry You can shift everything else to midnight. Maybe you work night shift. Maybe that work for a lot of people and that's great that'll just offset that and basically uh, what we call uh, just peak shave it'll take that shoulder and just so you don't have your huge spikes during the day so yes. And I guess to piggyback off that, I mean, we have very similar rates, um, you know, regulated utilities and other utilities. I mean, we can't just jump in there and change rates. It's got to go through the, the Public Service Commission or the Public Utilities Commission in Minnesota. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, there's there's time of use rates. There's, there's on off peak rates. Um, you know, on peak is 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Off peak is 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. Um, and you get you basically get a lesser charge for doing everything off peak. Uh, very similar, you know, you're doing your laundry at midnight or, or something like that, or, you know, I mean, generally not a lot of people are home. I mean, COVID has made a lot more people at home, so it's kind of a total opposite now. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I stress residents and I don't do a lot in the residential sector. Um, I'm more of the commercial side, but, you know, in commercial side, we've got, um, peak control where you know we ask a customer to go off of um, electric on that side and they'll fire up their generators and basically they get a discount for doing so um, and also on the gas side we have interruptible gas where we basically ask us a customer to curtail their gas use or, or lessen their gas use they get a discount for that um, you know kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul I guess you can say um, helps different areas of the country and, and different areas you know from what happened in Texas. Um, so I would suggest to residents to go out there and look at your rates. Most people, they ask for electricity or gas at their home and that's it. They It's hooked up and they just forget about it and they pay the bill, right? Well, there's programs out there for, like Paul said, for you know shutting off your air conditioner, cycling your air conditioner, cycling your water heater. Um, you know, that's, all these things can save you money and save energy. So. It's, I would suggest going out to your utilities website and just digging through it. Granted, not a lot of it's super interesting, but it, I mean, it is something to learn. So that's what I would suggest, I guess. Anything else for Paul? 
I have one more question for Paul and for Sean. Uh, it's kind of off the wall, but uh, this talk about shifting your time of energy use was making me wonder if during COVID, because we had so many people working from home, and I know I was doing things at all kinds of weird times that mm -hmm. aren't normal, like maybe I would take my shower at noon. Did we see any softening of these peaks uh, during that so, time nationally or regionally? <clears throat> uh, yes. So we, you know, obviously we have, uh, we keep track of, we can put all our residential meters into one virtual meter, all our commercial sector, and, and so on and so forth. And during the COVID, all of our commercial consumption went down and it was vice versa for the residential con consumption went way up. And now we're seeing that trend back to normal where it was pre-COVID. So definitely um, you could see that everybody was at home and spending a lot more time there. That's a really interesting question, Greta, of course. Uh, anybody else? Thank you, Paul, very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, I'll turn it back to you for the for the moment, and then we'll wrap up our meeting. Yeah, I, I put committee discussion on the agenda, and that's really what it's intended to be. It feels like I, I dominate this thing all the time. But I did want to give the committee an update, and this is based on uh, the presentation that Jen gave a few meetings ago. Um, it was titled Promoting Ecosystem Services with Sustainable Vegetation. I think I got that right. And it was really interesting to me and informative, and it was as well to our city engineer, Brenda Derrig, and our planning director, Nicole Crutchfield, and our public works director, Ben Dow. And so in talking with Brenda a little bit about that, uh, we're starting to work on some modifications to the city's standard specifications for construction. And I took a peek at the applicable sections, Brenda, so sorry. But section 3100 regarding turf uh, establishment and section 7000 regarding landscaping. So we talked about that, uh, maybe that was just as early as yesterday, but once we get some sort of draft uh, put together, we'd like to bring it back to this committee, share it with this committee, have some discussion, and maybe get this committee to endorse it on its way to the city commission. And so I was kind of excited about that because, Jen, you've created some action here out of the committee, so kind of proud of that. Well, and if, if I can uh, piggyback on that a little bit, is so I've been with the City since 1992. I can't do my math in my head yet. So for a very long time, <laughs> and it's been really exciting to kind of to see the the acceptance of prairie grass because there was a time where if it was not groomed Kentucky bluegrass, it was not the preferred option. And even when Osgood did their golf course, just the education of the neighbors, because you'd have beautiful landscape lands, landscaping, and then all of a sudden you'd have their prairie grass for the Osgood golf course, and just building that knowledge and understanding. And so it's it's been exciting and working on the Fargo project. And so just kind of seeing too, the residents being able to accept you know, different options uh, for landscaping other than a manicured green grass, I think is really exciting. Trust me, there's still some education going on because <laughs> <coughs> they blame our mice and our voles for going into the backyard, so. <laughs> we'll find a use for them too. Uh, anybody else? Bruce, are you, do you want to wrap up today? Yeah, and then uh, just kind of looking ahead, I got to give a shout out to Nicole Crutchfield. She uh, she provided some potential future topics for discussion, and one of them Brenda just mentioned, the Fargo Project. Uh, and then she thought, and I agreed with her, maybe uh, a little discussion on our tree preservation ordinance would be a good topic as well. Um, 
she threw me for a, a bit of a loop when she said a stormwater pond social and environmental benefits and it sounded really cool and <laughs> thought NDSU maybe could help us with that. And then uh, in our downtown in focus study that was completed a few years ago, it contained uh, a lot of green infrastructure recommendations that Brenda and I looked at and and some of it seemed like it was, uh, you know, how do you incorporate that into standard construction specs? But we'd like to talk with this committee about those things a little bit. And then uh, another really interesting thing we have going on right now is a, uh, it's a return on investment uh, strategy being put together to try guide our uh, our future growth and development patterns that we thought this group might really find interesting. So we're not there yet, but just a few topics and we welcome anybody that has any topic that they'd like to talk about, that'd be great, just let me know. Thank you, Bruce. And uh, so you all know at the staff administrative level, Bruce is driving this boat a lot and he's overseeing all of our departments and all of our city staff, all of our workers and physical facilities and plants and so on. So we have the right person here to, to help uh, aim us the right direction. But again, the, the, the notion that we have all of the, those of us at the table that we do, it occurs to me maybe at some point we'd be thinking of our universities, but for the moment we have, we have the city local infrastructure, we may think about county partnerships, but that's, that's gonna be our strength going forward is that ability to decide collectively that if, uh, if there's something we choose to do, uh, that we can put, put our heads together and really have more, more result and, and more, more bang for the buck, more impact. Um, anybody else for the good of the order? This is, we're, we're, we're still going forward. Bruce mentioned it, but uh, we're welcoming ideas, topics. If you have people out there that you think we might uh, hear from, share, <laughs> share, share, bless you, share that with us. Uh, let Bruce know and I that uh, you have topics to to consider, and we're welcoming them. and And at the right point in time, we'll we'll uh, if you have action items, we'll we'll embark on that path too. Ben, uh, I just wanted to bring it up and let everybody know that our solid waste division was lucky enough to take advantage of another clean energy grant uh, that came from the state, and uh, it, it's going to help pay for about twenty five percent of two new trucks. Hmm. So through the through diesel emission energy grants. So. That's a good win for our solid waste division. Okay. Nicole, did you? I you were raising your hand over there. Okay. Just one thing, uh, Paul. Can we have copies, or can I have Diana give us copies for a book of your presentation today? It's, I didn't know all the different states that were involved in your yep. different stuff, and yep. I, I'll I get that get for you, Mayor. And I apologize to Nicole. Those weren't my ideas. I'm not the genius. She is. So thank you for all those ideas. That was just an email for you, Bruce. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, 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 what resonates with me there is the notion that, you know, some of us don't know, but when we do a strategic plan or we do a core plan or a neighborhood, they really are active and alive ongoingly, and our people are always referring to them and bringing those topics back to us. That's good to remind us what others have agreed to do uh, and, and to set our values up for us to, to see. So there's real, real value to that. All right, July 13th is our next meeting. Um, feel free to communicate any topics and feedback. And One parting question, Brock, is our, uh, is our EV charging station functional out in the west parking lot? Um, at this point, we're waiting on one last piece. It is the transformer from Excel and then uh, the, uh, uh, the, the concrete. And then uh, obviously we've got to wait for that, but then the... Uh, I'm, I can't think of the gentleman's name with uh, the supplier of the EV charging station. He's got to come in and do um, basically a startup and get that going. So uh, we hope to have that, what, mid-July, I think. So should be up and running by then. Neat. We'll walk around it and look at it at our next meeting. Thanks, everybody. We stand adjourned.